power research institute and then our newest member from istanbul turkey is hits and solar and it's it's very exciting because um, we're as a site we are technology non-specific so um, i know i get a lot of people that will ask me what's so what's the best technology which what, what's going to work the best number one i can't answer that question because i have members that do all of it number two uh, I think it's going to be very interesting. With my background, I don't have a, I'm not a solar scientist, so I don't have a horse in the race, so to speak. I don't, it doesn't matter to me which one works, just as long as we use the ones that do work. So, uh, and in fact, it was very important to MRI when my position was filled uh, almost five years ago now, was to find somebody that wasn't, you know, specifically a PV guy or specifically a solar thermal guy because it felt like then that person would focus on just that industry and not focus on being a, an open technology type of facility. And I think it's going to be very interesting over the next few years. I mean, we keep seeing, I see surges in the development dollars that are put into uh, what happens in Solitech. When Solitech was first started, uh, you know, the thermal was on a tear and they were spending a lot of money and they were trying to get out of the door the quickest. They were trying to get things on the site the fastest. Um, and then there was a bit of a slowdown in the thermal side because, because some challenges in the industry popped up. Um, and then we saw a bit of a surge on the PV side. And then last year we saw a huge surge in uh, concentrated photovoltaics. Um, and Aminex was one of the, the biggest uh, systems. I'll show you some pictures there. the biggest systems in the world. Uh, they're 75 feet wide and 65 feet tall. They weigh about 45,000 pounds, the top piece, and uh, the foundations are over uh, 25 feet deep. But now we're seeing a surge in thermal again, and Hittite is, is one of those companies that's really surging. It's very, what's exciting about SolarTech is that each of our members uses SolarTech differently, because I'll, I'll get people call me, so what do you do for the member? What, what's the value? And my rhetorical question to them is always, what are you trying to if you're a business that, if you look at a development timeline of a product, of a technical product, all the way from sitting in a bar and sketching it out on a napkin to the point where you're actually selling it for a profit, there are different strike times during that timeline where SolarTech can make sense for a company. So you have to tell me where you are in that line and what you're trying to accomplish, and then we can talk about if SolarTech makes sense for you. In some cases, it might not. I talked to a lot of companies that were just too early for them. They don't have the money, they don't have a product developed enough to, to roll it out on a, on a massive scale, and so that's what uh, they need to wait a little bit. And those companies in two or three years, if they make it, then solar tax will start to make sense for them. So if we look at, just to pick a few examples, Excel Energy, they're doing a lot of integration studies because that's what's important to them. Uh, Sun Edison is an integrator. And in fact, they are now, they've been bought by MEMC. Um, they actually have their own products now. And so they're not only an integrator, they're also testing their own product development, which is, a, as you will find, as you start looking at companies, that's, that's a substantial shift in focus and an approach for a company. And then Abigoa, they do proprietary thermal systems. And so they are con consistently developing their systems into newer and better um, generations. Aminex is doing long-term reliability tests. The test is 10 years reliability for a half a megawatt system. Epri is a, 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 also a member-based organization. They represent, their membership represents about 90% of the electrons generated in the world every day. So literally almost every end user of solar power in the world is, is, uh, has a stake in solar tech. And so they will test different products based on what their membership wants to see tested for a long-term reliability test. And then, of course, Hittite, they have a brand new system. They're trying to get it rolled out at scale. They've tested it in pieces in Africa and Turkey. Now they want to put it all into a, uh, an all-inclusive single package with jet, uh, direct steam generation, storage, and power generation, and have a, uh, a tap for thermal steam for process use. So you see everybody is using us differently. And so I can't, I don't, I don't have a uh, straight up thing to say what solar tech can do for you. You tell me what you're trying to accomplish and then we'll talk about it. We'll talk about how that, how solar tech might help you. Um, this just really talks more again about the different technologies and the things that we're, we're testing all over. Um, 
you know, one of the things, it's very, it's been interesting to be a part of Solotac from the original vision. It was originally thought that uh, when, when Dr. Smith really conceived of Solotac, that there'd be a lot of companies doing very small projects uh, on the site. And so there might be 30 or 40 companies doing, you know, maybe projects the size of this room. And so the vision was that, you know, 74 acres would last 100 years and we'd never need any more land, um, that we would, you know, we'd have lots of these companies. And then along comes, number one, the economic downturn. But number two, what you find is technology companies, and this is not just solar, but technology companies in general tend to horribly underestimate the cost of construction. And I'll, I'll tell you, all, all of you guys want to find yourself a job that you can't get fired from, learn how to budget. Because I tell you, 90% of the people out there their budgeting process is, well, let's put down what we think it should cost and cut it by 20%. And then be completely amazed at the end of the year that you're 40% or 50% over budget. That's a miserable way to run a business. It's a miserable way to run a project and a, and a miserable way to try to plan your future. Okay, Figure out what the real cost is, add a contingency, and move on from there, and then work your keister off to beat your budget. And you'll be a hero, and everybody will wonder why. It's because you did your homework. You did it right. Um, it's one of those skills that is just way uh, missing in the industry, in, in all industries, frankly. I've, I've worked in them all. And if you can learn how to do that, you will uh, you'll be a hero, frankly. And so, you know, we've really got to get better at this, and that really adds time to time. And, uh, you know, because when you run over budget, then projects get delayed. We see this a lot in research. Uh, it's, Number one reason why research takes so long is because we have budget overruns or uh, the estimate, the early estimates are way off. When you start looking at large scale testing, um, and it's a big difference, let me, let me tell you, when you know a lot of these companies, they'll build a test model in their parking lot, they might build one for Walmart down the street. Running that one model compared to running 500 of them is a whole different animal. And what we saw with the rapid change in the industry was we needed much bigger spaces for our customers to use um, because of the expense of construction, um, because of the, uh, the actual learning that needed to come on with operations and maintenance with these systems. And so the whole model of SolarTech changed within the first year. And we went from seeking very small companies to do small projects to just a few companies doing very large research. Um, so at the site, um, in terms of all the technologies, we have one megawatt battery, we've got CSP systems from Japan, uh, from America, we have flat panels from all over the world, uh, azimuth trackers, fixed systems, dual axis trackers. Uh, we have two thermal systems now, two different uh, thermal technologies on the site. Um, this picture up in the, uh, the right hand corner is of a uh, mirror system, a heliostat system that was temporarily installed uh, up in uh, what was it, Boulder? Not too far from Boulder. Right? And they uh, it only had a temporary system. The uh, company tried to use it. wasn't real successful and so they actually donated it to SolarTac. It's about 3,000 mirrors, 3,000 dual access trackers, um, and four aiming towers. So. Where I have now lent that system, because it's about three and a half million dollars of equipment, so I have lent that system to NREL, and NREL is working with DOE to build a power tower. And the tower itself will be uh, at about 150 feet tall, take up about seven acres, uh, and it'll be, um, we're hoping, the first dual um, technology tower in the world, so that we can actually use the same heliostat field to test two different uh, center heat thermal things. Kind of excited about that. Uh, this second grid management battery that you see here is actually already, they broke ground on Tuesday this week, and so it's, uh, they're getting ready to install that this week. As uh, Ivan mentioned, we're right at, uh, just out by the airport. We're actually within the bounds of the city of Aurora, but we're not contiguous, so we're actually closer to Watkins. But if you're on a north-south, landing pattern and you're sitting on the right hand side of the plane, you will be able to see the Aminex units. There's 13 of them. Again, they're 65 feet tall and 75 feet wide. You can't, you can't miss them. You'll, you'll go right over the top of them. So 
keep an eye out for us. The reason this slide is in there when I do you know, business development presentations is the world has changed. You used to be able to, you know, the American buyer is a very hands-on, I want to see it, I want to touch it, I want to kick the tires buyer. Um, the German buyer is very different. German buyers can look at a manual, read the specs and say, that's exactly what I want. Bring it to me. Um, other buyers or other cultures around the world buy very differently. But if you're trying to get into the U.S. market, you cannot say, here's my brochure, buy my stuff. It doesn't work. The American buyer won't buy it. And so you need large-scale demonstration facilities here in the U.S. that people can actually see and touch and, and look at. Um, you know, you can't go on. You know, when this, when Solitec was conceived of, it's funny, just uh, about six years ago, you know, a whole contingent of folks from Excel Energy and MRI, you know, flew to Spain to look at a couple of demonstration facilities there to get some ideas about what it was like. If they were to try to do that today, coming out of a recession, nobody could get approval to make that trip anymore. So you can't even, if you're a buyer, you know, slip away for two weeks and go to Germany and look at a product to see if you're going to buy it. And so by having us here in Colorado, we're central to the U.S., we can get if you get anybody from the U.S. in three and a half hours to Colorado and back home the same day. It's a big issue. Again, it's about location and, and uh, you know, why you are where you're at. We'll mention the city of Aurora again uh, because they have, they literally have been a key part of making solar tech. The, the, as I said, my background is in design and construction of very large, complex facilities. And I knew very early on that it was going to be very difficult to permit large-scale utility systems with equipment that's never been seen before within the city limits under the building and fire codes. And you're talking about most utilities, when they build a power plant, they build power plants outside the building code. They don't have to follow the building code. They also get to follow their own standards for wire sizing, trans transformer sizing, that sort of thing. And they do not match the international electrical code. You start talking about people within the lower ranks of, of a city and how they do, the, you know, they have, a, they have a code book. And if it doesn't match the code book, their answer is no. It's just that simple. They don't, they don't get the leeway to say, well, that looks close, or I understand what you're doing. And so I knew it was going to be very difficult to permit these systems. And in fact, um, the way that you work within a political system is you have to have examples. You can't tell a mayor or a city council member, well, your people are going to fail. Because it's just noise to them. They won't believe you. They, they refuse to understand that. You have to have specific examples. So in fact, uh, my founding members, I actually threw them under the bus when we started this. I had them all start projects that I knew would never get permitted. So that I had specific examples to go to city council and the mayor and say, there's no way we can. this is ever going to work. Even though I knew it a year and a half beforehand. Uh, and sure enough, that's exactly what happened. I mean, almost to the day. Nope. Can't. And we go in and talk to them about, you know, we actually want things to fail. When you're doing research, you want to know what's the minimum amount of concrete that I can install for these systems to handle 90 mile an hour winds. And so you will put test systems in place and see which ones fall over. Nowhere in the code book does it say failing, falling over is a good thing. And we stood there and looked at them and said, this is what we're going to do. And they were like, Nah, we can't let you do that. I'm like, why? I'm like, well, because you'll lose money doing that. I'm like, yeah, this is called destructive research. That's, you, lose, you don't make any money on that. And they were like, we couldn't possibly let you do that. I mean, they just looked me in the face and said, we can't let you. We have to say, and I had a guy saying, we have to save you from yourself. <laughs> yeah, really? Oh, good. So what we did was we sat down with the city, with the city council, the city manager, and the mayor, and we actually changed the law. We wrote a special <coughs> ordinance for solar tech so that we can operate and do large-scale research testing at the site outside the building and fire codes. Never been done before in the U.S. But it's important to understand, because in, in, I'll go on another tangent here. As engineers, those of you who are engineers in the room, make sure you understand the codes. There is nothing worse that an engineer who walks into the city, this city says, this is all the stuff we want, and you walk out and say, okay, this is the city's making me do this. 
Because I can tell you, they don't know the code. And they will ask for everything. Even stuff that makes no sense, it will cost your client or your company millions. Know the code, because the powerful thing about a code is they can't ask for more than the code. And we get guys all the time, uh, you know, we have a fire water tank on my site for 74 acres of dirt. It's because the engineer at the time, before I got there, said, well, the city said we gotta have a 30,000 gallon tank of water, and so we put a quarter of a million dollar tank in the ground for 74 acres of dirt. Nowhere in the code does it say that. He said, well, the city said we had to. I said, they can't do that by law. They can only follow the code. So know the code. You can save millions by understanding the code better than they do. Um, so we went out, we wrote, we had an entire code uh, ordinance written specifically for us. And when you see the Aminex system, under the normal process of planning, stormwater, and building and fire codes, take about five years to permit the uh, system we'll show you from Aminex. I got that system under our ordinance permitted in six weeks. So if you think about a company who has, let's say they have $2 million worth of overhead a year, and they can, they can get their system in the field four and a half years earlier, that's a huge savings to that company. It's a lot of time to pay executives when you're sitting around trying to permit something for research. So when you go in and you start dealing with code officials, people in those sorts of positions know the code better than they do, and know that just because they say so doesn't mean that's the way it has to be done. You just have to be a little smarter. You have to work a little harder. And you can do anything. We can, if we set our minds to it, we had a city council, I had to go through city council three times to get my ordinance voted on. Anybody in here know what the average city council vote is for anything? There's nine members. What's the average vote? It's five to four. You usually win by one. You can go to any city in, in America, sit in a city council, and the average vote is five to four. And you always win by the skin of your teeth, or lose. We were 10 to zero, because the mayor was four hours as well. We were 10 to zero three times in a row. You can make it happen if you work at it. Um, you know, just, again, this is more of a business development slide than anything else, but it's really about you know, what are the values? Obviously, the permitting, if I can save you four and a half years in the permit. Uh, Hittite Solar signed with us in January or February and had the first set of their loop up on my site uh, by the end of March and blowing steam in the air. That's three months from the time that they decided to do a project and they actually were blowing steam in the air. And right now, their biggest issue is getting parts to the U.S. because they're bringing them all over uh, my seat. And when I talked to them up front, they, they said, well, what's going to be critical path is going to be permitting. I said, it's going to be, the critical path is going to be on your end. It's not going to be in our permitting system. Um, obviously, by having multiple companies on one site, we, we share costs for maintenance, that sort of thing. So it keeps our, our costs down per member. Uh, we have lots of technical resources, lots of inter. We're starting to really see now, you know, the, lot, the first three years was really about people getting their individual system set up. Now we're seeing interconnection of those systems and collaborative testing, which is um, really uh, pretty good things. I think I see in the future there's going to be workforce development. I think we're going to start having internship programs and those sorts of things to get uh, workforce, workforce going on. So now we get to the pictures, which you'll probably find more interesting than me talking away. But I show this picture because it, it, it makes me laugh because everybody's like, well, that's an interesting picture. But when you're a solar scientist, this is like the holy grail here. And in particular, what you don't see is the grid is right behind the camera. So we were all of about 100 feet, and at about a million dollars a mile to get to the grid, we were 100 feet away from connecting up to a brand new 8 megawatt line. So this, this is the holy grail. No, it's flat as a pancake, no trees, no houses, no neighbors. Um, it's literally exactly what they were looking for. You know, one of the things, one thing that we have going on in this country, and some of you, you folks will, will be involved in this, and, you know, again, here's a, I can talk soapbox issues all day. Um, protecting the environment is absolutely important. 
it, it, it's got to be a high priority for us. I mean, it, it makes no sense to destroy the environment that we live in. But it also makes no sense to hang ourselves in the process. And right now, stormwater, um, which is really the concept of making sure that that little piece of dirt right there that's probably been there two million years does not move six inches to the left, to the right, north or south, is it's impossible to do under business. 90% um, of what we spent getting this site prepped is in stormwater and dirt work. Um, dirt work's very expensive right now. For five acres, it's almost a million dollars to just to do, just to make it scrape it flat, get the weeds up. It's a lot of money to spend for just moving dirt. And so uh, there are little things, I call it death by a thousand paper cuts. There's a lot of things that we have right now that's being driven at the federal EPA level that are really hurting business. I mean, I had, it's about 8,000 feet around my site, give or take, and I had to have uh, silt fence all the way around that site, even on the uphill side. So, frankly, if I've got water running uphill, I have bigger problems than dirt water. So that means I have 4,000 feet of silt fence that has to be repaired weekly at $4 a foot that I spent money on maintaining just because there's a code somewhere that says it has to be there, a federal code. Can't even get out of that. And it prefers no, fun, no purpose and all of it went in the landfill. So when you move on through your careers and you start working, some of you will go into environmental protection. Try to think through some of these things and be a part of creating real solutions, not just bureaucracy and stamp things that we have to do. I put this in, and this was kind of funny. We decided we'd had this run of three months of 90 degree weather, it was beautiful, and we decided we're gonna have what we call the uh, powering up. We couldn't do a groundbreaking because they had already broken ground. We wanted uh, then Governor Rear to be there. Um, so we set this huge event up. It was 90 degrees the day before. We wake up the next morning for our event and we get a blizzard. I mean, it was a classic Colorado blizzard. And we're like, nobody is gonna show up for this thing. But we had at least had the foresight to have a tent, so we quickly ordered a bunch of heaters, um, you know, put down a bunch of uh, boards for people to walk on. Um, and we're just sitting there thinking, well, nobody's gonna show up. We had 200 people show up for out in the middle of nowhere, we had really nothing built yet, just a big flat area. Uh, even the governor, you can see uh, Governor Ritter showed up for us. So, and then you can see pictures of the crowd, everybody's crammed together. That's one of those things that's funny because everybody's gonna remember it. No, nobody, anybody that was there will never forget the, uh, the solar tank opening in Blizzard. Uh, these are just different pictures of the infrastructure. Uh, we've installed uh, communication conduits throughout the site. We have water and sewer piping in, but the city doesn't have water to us just yet. We haven't developed that far. Um, this picture on the left, that is the 2000, uh, 2007 CU Decathlon House. So that's a house from this university for the Decathlon program. Uh, we did install it at the site. To give you an example, okay, this house was designed by students, built by students, and is a home put on a commercial site. It is not covered under my ordinance because it's in the public area of my site. Three and a half years to get this certificate of occupancy on the house. <coughs> and a lot of political work on it. Because it, it flat out will never be covered. The picture up there in the uh, Upper left is the one and a half megawatt battery. You can see the Amnex units in the background. Um, this large, what we call the blimp launching facility, is Avangoa's testing structure for uh, they build large solar thermal troughs and then they hang cameras and lasers up in that structure so that they can mimic the sun. So they can assemble these in blocks and then take them out into the, sun, out into the, uh, out the field. Again, that's the decathlon house today, all completely repaired, back up and operating. This is our, on the left hand side, that's our MET station. It's about a quarter million dollars for that set of equipment you see there. Um, 
NRAIL, it's the most accurate system in the world. N NRAIL comes out, cleans, and calibrates it every day for me. So it's, we have almost perfect data coming out of it. That's our site. If you kind of remember the artist's rendering back at the beginning, uh, you can see it's different. We're doing things on a much larger scale. Um, let's see if the pointer will work here. Just to give you some idea of scale, these are the Amex units. That little white dot right there is a full-size Suburban. That gives you any idea. Um, our 75 acres ones in a semi-circle here. This is the gap on the house right up in here. Um, this picture was taken a year ago. I'm just about ready to take my new, I'm going to take an aerial photo every year so we'll have a historical picture of how solar attack developed. Um, this space here is all, ground has been broken, They're get, EPRI is going to build um, another six to eight uh, PV systems in that space to test. This piece of ground here, this is the one and a half megawatt battery, uh, grid connected. Uh, there's about three acres right here that Excel Energy is building what they call their community program. That facility is where they're going to mimic an entire, a feeder that would feed an entire uh, neighborhood. So what they're going to do, they're going to put in load banks that will mimic uh, the load on a house. So they'll put in several house loads. They're going to put in generation at the residential level, generation at a bigger medium level. And then they've connected three of these units into that system. And they're going to have just one single feeder. And so they'll be able to start studying where's the best place for storage. They're adding their second battery, which is going right here right now. They broke ground this week. Battery's going right here. It's a Fion battery. Um, probably a half a megawatt instead of one and a half. They'll be able to start switching around where they're going to put the storage, where do they put the generation so they can turn generator on and off and see what happens to the reactive power, what happens to integration issues in that feeder so they can start to decide, do they really want you putting power on your house or should you be putting it in your neighborhood and serving an entire you know, block of houses or should it be at the utility scale out on the line? That grid I told you about runs right along Hudson Road right here. So we can hit, that grid can handle about 8 megawatts from us. We're probably at a megawatt and a half today. Our density is very low because it's research. A lot of it's on and off, being taken apart and put back together. So then this is Avangoa. Their troughs will go here. In fact, they just, they had several troughs sitting here. They just disassembled them because they were old, old technology. And they're going to put them back, put the new technology back in. Um, Kitite has set up their first unit right here and they will actually run the, the length of this as well with their five acres of uh, direct steam generation. This project right here, this is the, uh, it's an NRAIL project but it's where NRAIL collaborated with ICE AIST which is the Japanese version of NRAIL and they built a cross-continental CPV comparison project that's been running for I think about two years now. Um, all of this space now has been filled in right here with uh, Sun Edison and different uh, tracking systems and panels, that sort of thing. They have just a little bit, they got about two acres of growth remaining, and they'll have their system filled up. This little space right here is the only four acres I have left uh, on the site. This over here, this seven, let's see, well, there's three projects going on here. Right here is a um, thermal test facility that NRL's building, where they're gonna be able to bring in truck-mounted thermal media for testing its capacity to store thermal energy. Um, they just finished all the foundations. The equipment, the manifold, and all of the boilers and that sort of thing, stuff shows up in October. So we'll be installing that over Christmas. They're gonna build a 2,000 square foot building here for uh, testing, indoor testing of panels. They put them in these boxes where it's completely black and do specific chemistry testing on, on the panels. Um, this seven acres right here is where the power tower is gonna go that I mentioned. And then out in this 16 acres back here is going to be where the uh, DOE is going to build their what they call the regional test facility, which is where companies will come to them, pay them money to install their system, they'll do a long-term reliability test on it, and then it sort of gets the bankability check uh, stamp of approval from NREF so that these systems can be financed when it's all done. So in terms of my presentation, I got to the end, I thought 
I also have a slideshow of just more pictures that I thought I could run in the background here well uh, if there are any questions. Anybody ask for me? Questions, please? Yes? Right, so we'll, we'll we give them space. Um, we help them get through the permitting process, even though it's a truncated process. There's still a lot of uh, real world experience that's valuable, you know, that scientists don't necessarily have in building large scale things. So I help them get through the building process. A lot of times I'll help them with um, planning of their area so that they lay it out so it can be modified and with growth in the future. Uh, I also can help them with finding engineering and construction companies that are appropriate for the work that they're doing. Anybody else? So, um, yeah, speak up. I'm getting old. Sorry. So yesterday we were told that one of the biggest problems in solar farms is grass. Um, do you have any specific way that you deal with that, or, or is it just? Well, each of our members are looking at different things. Okay. Um, our site, it's, it's been funny because our those, the dirt on our site is sort of a mixture of clay and sand, which is great when it's dry and miserable when it's wet. I mean, really miserable. Um, it, it's almost impassable when it, when it gets, you know, if we've had rain for two or three days, it's almost impassable. So I made a lot of recommendations early on to put in gravel, uh, you know, six inches of gravel for the folks that install these systems. Some people listened to me and some people did not. Most of the people that did not now have gravel in their areas. Um, we are having, we have a bit of a difference of opinion. It's my opinion that we, you know, we keep the weeds out of that gravel and keep it, you know, keep it set. Um, we have a few members that are letting the weeds grow up. I think they're going to be disappointed because weeds just destroy gravel and its integrity. And so, but it's all maintenance costs, right? It's, it's all about balancing upfront costs. Obviously, gravel is horribly expensive to bring in, um, but it's it's not any good when you can't get in there when you need to. Um, different types of gravel, you know, heavier gravel. I think the heavier gravel is nice because it it's it's easy to spray those weeds and then pull them out. So there are a lot of differences of opinion. Most of it, I think, is most of the opinion of not to have it is based on just money. But I think the usability is much higher. We have a few folks, Hittite, and in, in fact, really wants to try to see if they can get grass to grow under their systems. I, I like the idea. I mean, it, it, they think in their mind it, it becomes a, a marketing point that it's green and the, you know grass is growing and the rabbits are happy. And, but the reality is all the rabbits are is destructive little mammals. You know, they're, they're, they're horrible. They eat everything, chew on everything. Um, I'm going to import a fox, I think, <laughs> so you wipe them out. But they're horrible. Um, you, you start getting in there and you start mowing under these things. Well, who does the mowing? It's not the scientists. It's, you know, a guy off the street. Does that guy care that that mirror costs 300, you know, a couple hundred grand? You know, he doesn't mow rocks and breaking them. And, you know, so, I mean, there are real world things that, you know, we get lots of learning at our site about that exact kind of a thing. Anybody else? I answered all the questions. Okay. Uh, have you had any communication with first soldiers in this thing? You know, uh, the answer is probably yes. I've talked to hundreds of companies. Um, the flat panel industry really has been very resistant, quite frankly, of doing their own large scale testing. Uh, their philosophy, I think, in, in, in mass, and this is a personal opinion, so don't write this in the business journal, but I think their, their approach has always been to sort of have the customer do their, their large-scale testing for them, and they just replace them if they, they go out. Um, the more expensive, more complex systems like concentrated uh, PV, they really have been adopted the idea of doing large-scale testing before they roll them out. They're much more complex and much more expensive to fix. Um, just have not had a lot of interest on their site. Now you see, there's a lot of flat panels on um, Sun Edison site, but a lot of that is because number one, they're an integrator, and then number two, they are now uh, a manufacturer because MEMC manufactures panels, and so they are actually 
having a somewhat of a spike in doing flat panel testing, which is interesting because it'll be interesting to see if the rest of the industry follows. If it does, I'm going to need more land. Go ahead. Right. That's part of what we're working on is, is what, what, what does make sense. Now most of, 99% of what's done at SolarTAC is all going to be mid-grade to utility scale. You know, having one big farm or at least pretty what I call district sized systems, which are systems that would feed a neighborhood, so to speak. We don't do a lot of residential, although we are mimicking residential, residences on Excel site. Um, you know, for me personally, the biggest challenge with residential I, I guess I'll say two things. Number one, any time that you can generate an electron from the sun, that's good stuff. You know, it's hard to, it's hard to say that's a bad thing, right? But number two, the, the problem becomes maintenance. Um, it's specialized. You know, the, the normal homeowner, I myself, if I had panels, I live in a bunch of trees, so I couldn't even have any on my roof. But if, if I had panels on my roof, I could not maintain that system myself. And I've built, you know, huge facilities. And, and, and the, the normal homeowner is not going to want to drag themselves up on the roof. I mean, it stinks once a year to go put your Christmas lights up, you know. But to go up every single month and clean the panels and make sure they're all working. Because, you know, at DC panels, if one's out, then the whole system, the whole voltage is down. So if you've got one bird that flew up there and did his business on your panel, you got to get there and clean it. Is that really something you want to do, you know, in the middle of the winter? So personally, I think that... Uh, you know, for those people who want to do that, more power to you. But I think on the, on the large, longer term view, systems that are medium sized or what I call district sized to, to very large systems are probably where things are going to be sitting. So maybe just one more quick question if you have any. Do we need one back here? Yeah, I can ask it. Actually, no, I will ask it. Uh, one of the things that this group is going to get over the next three weeks is we're going to be talking about efficiencies of solar cells. In fact, the next speaker is going to be talking about the efficiency of the cell. And then we're going to go to the modules and then to the arrays. And what we can see here is a massive dilution of, of that number because you have the space between the panels and you have to access it. How much, how much effort do you put into not throwing away that space? Because, of course, we'd all like to see it completely covered no roadways, ideally no concrete, definitely no gravel. It's all in adding to the balance of systems cost. Right. So do you have a, do you have a figure of, of how much the dilution of the efficiency of the, of the whole system is relative to the panels that you're installing? Yeah, no, because each area is operating as a separate company. So each of these, each of those areas I showed you that have, so Sun Edison, they don't share their, their data with everybody else. Aminex doesn't share their data with anybody else unless they have a collaborative project. And so the, uh, you know, the efficiency they have as a set, you know, so if Aminex's efficiency of their 4.8 acres, they don't share that with the rest of us. I think, in fact, it's very high. Um, as a site, it's terrible because it's a research site and we have a lot of open space. We have a lot of areas for construction lay down and roads and access and all that sort of thing. Which also goes back to the question before, where if you do put them on the roof of your, your home, you already own that piece of land and you already own that roof. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I, I disagree with your statement about you want to go up there, but if, if this is going to be an industry, then there, we have people that will go around and clean the windows of your house. It doesn't take much more to ask them to clean the panels on the roof of your house. So it's another industry, so that can be beneficial, not detrimental. I'm not, yeah, and I, I, that's why I changed my statement earlier and said, anytime you create an electron from the sun, that's good stuff. I have nothing against that. Um, I just be personally believe that, that the bigger the system, the more the, the efficiency gets. I mean, it, there are working already in Germany on robots that'll actually clean the panels. Can't get any cheaper than a robot, you know, from a day to day perspective, if it works. 
Okay, I think this was a wonderful transition from our uh, skill challenges part of the program to a more technical program we'll have today and later during the summer school. So uh, let us uh, say thank you to our speakers. And I would like just to mention a couple